Last time I saw Steve, I think I was on a pontoon with him. And uh, were you uh, a little bit seasick? Still managed to uh, neck a beard off him tonight. Um, well, thank you. And um, uh, thank you to Ezekiel earlier on who did his uh, welcome to country. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging on the Kui Kui. Uh, land that we're on now, but also to those on the Great Barrier Reef uh, for their continued efforts to manage and protect that extraordinary place for the future. Um, yeah, Steve's, um, Steve's news on the two degrees is uh, very very depressing, I think. Um, we were talking about this before before the uh, event started this morning and saying like, you know, um, citizen science gets almost no investment and yet we have these two immense problems in front of us. One, we've got to dramatically cut emissions. And then secondly, we've got to massively scale up our conservation efforts because we left everything so bloody late. And so when you think about that, uh, there is a role for citizen science which goes far beyond what we see today. So what I'm going to try and show you today is what we've been trying to do on the Great Barrier Reef. And in many ways, we look at the Great Barrier Reef as kind of a, I mean, it's the poster child for climate change, but we want to see it as kind of the inspiration for change. Um, we see it as a kind of place to pilot citizen science on an industrial level. So that's what we're, what we're trying to, uh, to do. But to give you, I'm going to go straight into the biggest project that we work on, which involves citizen science. And uh, take you back to 2016, 2017, when we had those sequential bleachings on the reef, El Nino years, of which we're in one now. And uh, there was an emergency conference held in Townsville in 2017, in July 2017. And uh, I ended up sitting down at a table with the now chief scientist of, of the Marine Park and another guy, a guy called Roger Beaton and another guy called uh, Pete Mumby, who works for UQ. And one of the things that came out of this conference was the need for broad scale reconnaissance data on the Great Barrier Reef, which is bigger than Germany. And uh, I love this uh, infographic just to give you a sense. I mean, you all know the Great Barrier Reef is massive. But if you put it up uh, alongside the USA, it would go from above the border with Canada to below the border with Mexico. So we're talking somewhere, something very big. So how do you get scale? How would you get broad scale reconnaissance on an area that is that big? Because no one's gonna give you the billion dollars you might need for the research flotilla that would do that. So when we think about citizen science, we think about assets. So it's sort of shared economy. How could you build almost like an Uber version of a research flotilla out of all the vessels and people that are on the Great Barrier Reef. And so that's where we started um, our sort of first pilot. Now I put the, long, the wrong slide in this deck. This is actually the international slide. When we started this, you can, um, you can uh, remove reefs around the world and put in GBR, Great Barrier Reef. But this is what we're trying to do. Conduct, conduct large scale reconnaissance, ground truth habitat maps, um, provide marine logistics to get all this to come together. But actually what we were really playing with here was could you sort of create an operating system that would bring together all these different assets to achieve um, considerable conservation outcomes? So it could be research, but as we go into harder and more difficult times, can you do more than that? Can you do restoration projects? Can you find the reef where you're gonna make the biggest impact? Can you combine this with some of the best experts on the reef and the park managers where the, where the rest of the community starts to play a very significant and meaningful role? So that's where we were. That's where our heads were at when we first started the, uh, the project. So we're talking about how do you capture data. Now, again, I was talking about this with Steve earlier on this morning. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this would have been really hard to do. But technology is moving so fast now that we can actually facilitate things that you wouldn't have imagined uh, back in the, at the beginning of this century. Um, one of the biggest challenges if you're trying to get photographs of the Great Barrier Reef is if you're asking citizens to do it, you know, your dive instructors or your tourists or your skippers or whoever it is, um, trying to get the camera, trying to get the images out of the cameras, really hard work. So we found that when we first piloted, what you find is that people will take, they might, you might get them to get the pictures, but then when they get home, they go to the pub or they go and see their family and you never see the pictures. So we were thinking, okay, well, how can we uh, overcome that problem? So we, we deployed edge devices, little computers onto lots of different boats so that when you came out of the water, you could upload straight onto an edge device. When that comes back into range, because it might be somewhere very remote, when it comes back into range, it would automatically upload. So this is um, 
this is the uh, the HTML what you see on your uh, on your laptop if you're if you're um, out at sea doing census at the moment. You, it'll come up with where's which reef are you on. You can put a pin in the map or you can put coordinates in, and then you can upload your images. So it's pretty easy. However, this is going to get easier and easier and easier. So the blocks to getting people to do things are going to be removed by technology. We're already seeing that. Uh, Adam, who's going to talk later from the Reef Ecologic, was showing me uh, these new camera cases for iPhones. So you can actually take your iPhone in like you would with a Canon camera and capture your data. Now that is a big leap because it means you're going to get better geopositioning. You're going to be able to use your camera that's on your phone in a safe way without it getting wet. So there's an exciting kind of future ahead of here, which is, as I said, it's almost like we could industrialize citizen science in a way that we can't, haven't imagined before. In the first year, we went out in the first year, we did a pilot in 2019 out onto the Hard Lines Reef. Just one boat, a boat called Champagne Princess. Um, she was no longer a princess and had seen a lot of champagne. Uh, very dodgy old boat, but anyway, did a good pilot. And, um, uh, and then in 2020, we were sort of trying to get ready to go. Now, in 2020, you may remember there's this COVID thing that happened. So, unusually for uh, most organizations, we, uh, we, we got a lucky break there because all the boats were sitting in all the harbors, not doing much, still needing to run their engines, and with most of, the, most of their staff on job keepers. So, we actually had our flotilla ready to go. So that's how we kind of got the thing running in the first place. In the first year, we got to about 140 reefs out of 3,400 or something or other. Um, most of it was scuba. Um, uh, and as you can see, a lot of people had quite a lot of fun at the same time. But as time's gone on, this thing's got bigger and bigger and bigger. There's now about 100 vessels involved. So it's a fairly large flotilla, motley flotilla though it is. Um, and here's a good example. This is uh, the Irukandji Rangers, so sea country is just sort of north of Cairns, up to Port Douglas. Um, the guy doing the incredibly uh, cool pose, that's Tarquin. Um, he's one of our rangers, works with us on another project called the Reef Cooperative, which I'll show you a bit later. Um, and they basically uh, went out and surveyed their sea country. And in those years, we found some pretty cool stuff. So this is a shipwreck that we found up in the north near Wishbone Reef. So very, very far north. And well, you can see that round circle, that's a, that's a, a milling stone. And uh, to tell you through this, it was in the second year that we did census, it was flat calm for three months. It was the most extraordinary year. Uh, and we were floating. I actually happened to be on this particular boat, not the wreck, I'm not that old, the boat that was doing the survey. And uh, we were going from one side to the reef to another, and the, the first mate on that boat spotted round river stones on the top of the reef. And uh, he goes, oh, this river stone. So we started looking, it looked like ballast. And it turned out it was in the shape of the hull of a ship. And then we started to see these little objects in the water. So uh, I think there's something like 600 wrecks on the Great Barrier Reef, of which uh, only about 10 or 20 percent have been found. I might have made those stats up though. How many was it? 800. There you go. Told you I made it up. Um, but also, whilst we've been doing this, uh, we've recovered quite a lot of ghost nets, about three tons of ghost nets off the Great Barrier Reef, and we've marked a whole load more. And there's other organisations like uh, Tangarella Blue that are out there asking us to to mark nets with satellite um, uh, trackers so that they can go get them themselves. So you start to see what you've got here is not just uh, a mission to go and capture reconnaissance imagery off the Great Barrier Reef, but also a potential way of doing multiple other tasks all at the same time. Uh, the data from this, I should have probably started with this, has been used by the Crown of Thorns Starfish uh, program uh, to start to look for the reefs which have got a, a lot of food source on them, these are uh, beasties, uh, but also where we're seeing uh, crown of thorns starfish. And last year, we actually worked on a standard operating procedure to apply to some of the more extreme expeditions, which was done in partnership with the uh, GBR Foundation, um, to, to sort of build that into this process. So what you're seeing over the years is more and more detail, more and more um, uh, uses for this, uh, this activity, and more and more credibility being built into it. One of the biggest challenges with citizen science it's generally it's a little bit sneered, sneered upon by a lot of a lot of the older sort of science community. But what the way that I see this happening is it's developing. If it developed with the same kind of budgets that some of the other stuff was, you would see it moving much faster. Um, but you started to see citizen science being a very, very practical way of getting very large scale very quickly. 
But this is what we're really after, the key source reefs. So we were trying to find these, the reefs that, I've stolen this from Professor Mumby, um, uh, that show the connectivity between these different reefs. So what I can start to see here, if it works, yes it does, is you know, you've got a, an amazing reef, that, that reef's rebooting the reefs around it. So we're trying to map and mark where those key source reefs are. And we found dozens and dozens and dozens of them, of them across the whole of the GBR already. Let me zip through this. There you go. Pete does a really good shot on that. Uh, so we're now into Great Reef Census 4. These were the statistics after Great Reef Census 3. So we've got the 510 unique reefs. Just under 1,000 reefs have been visited. Some have been visited more than once. Um, there's around 100 vessels involved, off and on. Um, and uh, 90,000 is now about 120,000 images have now been collected. And census is happening right now on the Great Barrier Reef as we speak. Um, now we can see the types of boats, there's all sorts involved. So tugs, research vessels, dive boats, tourism vessels, recreational fishers, uh, all sorts of uh, the kind of vessels. So it is really a motley flotilla, as I said before. And then all the data is starting to be brought together now you could do some amazing stuff with this data. Everything we've been doing here has been basically run on the smell of a very small oily rag. Um, and uh, so you, you can, what we're trying to prove here is the value of citizen science, the, the opportunity to scale it on an amaz at an amazing level. Um, but you can start to see the results and then augment it so people can see it and feel what they've done. Right? Um, with the view that it's not just the Great Barrier Reef that's suffering um, at the moment, and as I said, it's an El Nino year. We passed it two degrees yesterday. You know, this is something that is a challenge across the globe. So building it on the Great Barrier Reef for export to other places in a way that is as close to free as we can possibly do it is basically the ambition here. After the second year, I said it was flat calm, so we ended up capturing way more photographs in the first year and getting to way more reefs. We got to about 310 reefs in the second year. And, um, and it really was because it was so calm. It was incredible. Um, but that actually gave us a problem, and it was a pretty bad problem for us, which was we had so many images. In the first year, we tried to get citizen scientists to help us analyze the images that had come back. But we only had about 13,000 images in the first year. And the platform that we built in the first year was a bit crap. It didn't work very well. And actually, the data that citizen scientists went through to try and analyze we were able to use about 0.02% of it. In other words, it wasn't working. Um, so after the second year, we were like, okay, so we've got, the second year we have about 40,000 images. And we we're like, okay, how are we gonna uh, analyze these? So we've been working with Dell on those edge devices, Dell Technologies, big com computer company. Um, and uh, they lent us their AI team. And what we we're trying to find was a way of not um, taking the humans out of this, but actually coming up with a hybrid way of using people and AI to help us get very rapid analysis of the images as soon as they came out of the water. So what you can see here is these are classic images from the census. So we're particularly looking for plate coral, boulder coral, and branching coral. We want to know how much is on and what sort of the mix is on, on, on each reef and on all four sides of an average reef. So the pressure points at either end, the lagoon side or the wild side if it's an average reef. So we can see here in the in the uh, on the far side, the expert science side that's been drawn using a cursor. So they'll draw around the different types of coral with a cursor. And that was the data we used to train the AI. Um, so that AI down the middle was after five months of work on it. I have to tell you there were points, especially early on, where I thought the whole project was gonna fall over because we couldn't analyze the images. So there's a big thing about scale. Scale requires innovation and help. Um, this is what it looks like now. This is, a, this is actually really fresh. This is tweaked about two days ago. So basically the AI has been trained, but we, we used human eye as well, because what we've worked out is the human eye is really good at spotting certain things better than the AI, especially at the top and the bottom amount of coral cover. Um, and, uh, the, but we've been tweaking the system, so we now have thousands and thousands of people all over the world helping do the analysis. And this is how to do it. So we had a sort of brief to ourselves, which, which was this. We wanted somebody who was commuting to work on a bus in Jakarta to be able to analyze an image accurately within two minutes. That was our imaginary person. 
So it's now the average, if you've done more than five photographs, the average to get an accurate analysis is 42 seconds per photo. And it's quite addictive, which is part of the gamification. Now, again, this is kind of quite rudimentary. In our imaginations, we could do very, very many more things, but it works and it's pretty good. There's about 6,500 uh, regular citizen scientists from over 60 countries doing this now after the first year of trialing this. And we trialed this platform this year uh, from April till July. Um, to give you a sense of, again, the oily rag problem, which is you've got no cash, we have a partner which is Cotton On, and we trialed this. We wanted to trial the platform, the sort of uh, one of the prototypes, with people that knew nothing about the reef. So we went to their call center down in Geelong, trialed it with 300 people who knew not very much about the reef, uh, but were lovely and extremely passionate. And that's how we started to kind of work out the glitches and how we could scale it up. And here's the other one. There's a, an amazing person in my team, Nicole Sen, who um, got a $20,000 grant from the Queensland government for citizen science. And she turned that into a pilot program uh, to test our AI and, and human eye hybrid. Um, she went out to a whole lot of schools, about seven schools, and um, she was trying to get 1,000 images analysed. These kids were absolutely amazing. So they analysed over 24,000 in two weeks. Here's little Charlie. He's a perfect example of one of the kids that did it. Uh, and this is the note that his mum sent to Nick in my team. Makes me kind of happy this night. Um, and I'll tell you another story as well. We, I'm from Cairns, and um, there's a school in Cairns, Cairns High. And the headmaster rang Nick and said um, that he'd just gone past the room where there were a whole lot of kids in detention, and they were all on iPads. And so he was going in there to give them a ticket off. Um, but it turns out they're all doing analysis. Uh, so we're now obviously developing a campaign for more kids to get into detention. Uh, oh, there you go. I have never had a joke clap before, whoever did that. That is the first, thank you. Um, so here's, here's the coolest bit. This is really, really new. This is so, as I said, we work with the uh, University of Queensland, the Mumby Lab, and uh, we have this amazing guy, Dr. Chris Lawson, who's been doing all the back-end um, um, work on the analysis. We got a, or they got a National Environmental Science Program grant to do this. Now, for us, there is no point in doing this for just awareness. Not interested. It's a byproduct. What we really want is outcomes. We want the science to be rigorous. We want to prove that the role of citizen science in this age is at the beginning of a breakthrough age, that it could revolutionize what we can do, what we can do. And so accuracy is critical. Good data is critical. And uh, this is what we've got now. These are the results of what happens when we use a combination of the AI and human eye when it's compared to our expert analysis. So everything, so those numbers are pretty bloody good. You can't get much better than that, to be honest with you. I'm sure we can tweak it a bit, but that's pretty good. In other words, it's pretty accurate. Now, there are certain bits you have to work through which bits the humans are good at, which bits the AI are good at, and how can you get the best mixture between the two. But the guys at UQ have been absolutely amazing at this. Um, and it is a really amazing collaboration to get all these people working on this ambition and mission. So how do we get the numbers when you've got no money? Well, we did a couple of things. First, uh, I used to run Earth. I don't run that anymore, but I used to run Earth. But one of the things we learned in Earth Hour was that the, the media industry, particularly the ad buying industry, are incredibly useful. We worked with a company called Mindshare who got us about $5.6 million worth of free ad space to run a campaign. But that got us quite a few thousand people. But the other thing we did, we went out to a whole lot of our corporate partners, corporate friends, and um, started virtual volunteering. And so let's get, a lot, as you would know, a lot of companies do virtual volunteering with their staff. They get a day, a year, or whatever it is. So we built leaderboards so we could track how much time they were spending on it, how many images they were doing. They could incentivize it inside the companies and reward good employees have done more and more. Uh, so, and it's gamified. So you can start to see, for example, with the Disney one, you can see it's people all over the world are helping. So we had nine big companies this year. Our ambition for 2024 is to increase that, obviously. Um, but it's pretty amazing. And then if you look at the last one, the Paddy one, um, a, there is a community out there of divers and dive shops, often on reefs, who also want this technology. So that if, as we build it, we build it to be open source, we build it to be used by anyone in the world. 
And that's how you know you start to get that scale, which you can't get if you're just paying dollar after dollar for experts. Can't do it. Uh, I won't tell you all that. Um, so uh, this was a bit of the campaign. Uh, now I was lucky enough when I was working on Earth, I worked with Leah Burnett's um, ad agency. I didn't work, I worked for WWF, but um, uh, I got the same guy who did the original creative for Earth out to do the creative for this. And, come up with this beautiful kind of standard image which hopefully will become famous as time goes on um, to get more and more people to help and that's the ad space so I think we reached 23 million eyeballs in Australia with no money I think we spent $23,000 on the campaign yeah um, and currently we've had 151 images analyzed so accurately analyzed that means they've been done about five times so that's the census now for me uh, as I've said, this, uh, this project was designed and built on the Great Barrier Reef, which is actually quite hard to survey because you've got a lot of remote reefs. We're actually working on one in Hawaii at the moment and in the Red Sea at the moment and in Kenya at the moment. Often they're fringing reefs, so much closer to the coast, so you don't need expedition boats. People can just go off the beach and survey. But what you start to see again is this idea of being able to mobilize thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people to help in conservation. This is obviously tough doing it in the marine environment, but there's no reason why you can't take a lot of the lessons and put it into the terrestrial environment. So that's, that, that's it for the census. I'll just quickly uh, wrap up with the Reef Cooperative. If census is all about scale, massive scale, the cooperative is about, okay, so what would you do if you knew uh, the state of a reef or a, a reef that you wanted to help restore and protect? And on the Great Barrier Reef, that's very much driven by the traditional owner engagement side of things. So we built this thing called the Reef Cooperative, um, funded by the Cotton On Foundation. Um, it's a combination of tourism organization, university, Mars Sustainable Solutions, which is the chocolate Mars, who have a really amazing um, uh, reef uh, project called uh, um, Reef Stars, which I'll show you in a sec, uh, and Dalwaru were the original uh, people. So that's Ira Kanji, again, the PC countries just north of Cairns. Um, and we started with some really simple stuff. We want to put 700 of these reef stars in on um, uh, Irukandji Sea Country on Hastings, Norman, and Saxon Reef. These things stabilize coral, or stabilize the, uh, the, the seabed where it's turned to rubble. And um, let me see if I can jump forward a little bit. There we go. Hang on. So, what happens is they put bits of uh, coral fragments onto these stars and then pop them in the water over the rubble area. And they are amazing. They actually sort of build the architecture of the reef again. So that's as they're just going in. That's after one and a half years. That's after two years. So if you swim over one of these, you can't see them anymore. Now, we know the bleaching is maybe coming again this year with Elmina. We don't know what will happen to these, whether they will survive or whether they will not. But we are at an age now where we have to be trying everything in the hope that humanity pulls down emissions rapidly and that we've got something to save in the end. But again, this is a, a great example of um, a community coming together to try and work out how they can help. And a community coming together using data that's been brought by the broader community, even people somewhere in Jakarta, to help them find those reefs. So I'm just gonna go back a couple of things there. Let's step forward. So this whole program is sort of all linked together with the idea that we're bringing in schools and companies, global companies, technology companies, government where possible, um, tourism industry. So you're actually building a collective. Um, anyway, that's pretty much it from me. You see this kids are uh, sort of linked to sea country and doing census at the same time. So there's so many ways it all crosses over together. And my one, one bit to everyone here is that we know, because we live it, that every day is a struggle for cash. And that citizen science is still not recognized in the way that I think it should be. That often the default is to remove humans from um, getting outcomes. My passionate belief, and I've seen it with Earth Hour, is you could mobilize billions of people if we wanted to. But we need to be taken more seriously as, a, um, as an innovation rather than a kind of, oh, that's nice. So that's my, my view on things as it stands. But anyway, thank you very much for listening. This is, by the way, going to be launched on the 1st of December. It's a reef
intervention training program led by Kun Ganji and Eric Kanji as part, <coughs> as part of the cooperative. So the little factory building restyles and bring more of the community together to do more practical in the water conservation. Thanks very much. Okay, we've got a little bit of time before uh, morning tea, so any questions for Andy? Anyone still awake? Yes, over here. I'll just give you a microphone. And... Hi, my name's Justine. I'm from Southwest Victoria on a very small program. But what's your recommendations for people like myself running these really small scale projects? What recommendations do you have for us for scaling and for making actual change? Uh, my core team is, is five of us, so it's not big. Um, but we've built a collective of organisations. So University of Queensland being one, but the tourism uh, companies, big companies, um, so I think it is possible to be bigger than you are, if that makes sort of sense. Um, I think the biggest struggle we have is core funding. It always is. And one of those is the, the sort of the brand of citizen science is still not where it should be. Um, so I guess two things in that. First one is um, collective effort will raise more funds, which will get more done. And the second one is it is really important that we make the argument that citizen science is as important an innovation as some of the more industrial end stuff that's happening in conservation or uh, and that it isn't pinned as only awareness so i think practical outcomes super important talking about practical outcomes super important sharing information really important as well um, and i think we should be hunting more as a pack than we are at the moment typically that's hard to do though Thanks, Andy. That was a wonderful presentation and thank you for doing your bit to elevate uh, citizen science and, and demonstrate the value of it. I'm just wondering how you account for dead calm. Is that something that's involved in your census? Yeah, senses? it's a really good question. So we're trying to, it's interesting with the AI, we're actually looking at the moment whether or not we can start to track that more successfully. There is some areas where we're noticing in photographs that people don't, aren't, uh, uh, have trouble spotting it but what we're using AI for is really to assist so for example when you looked at that slide that I was saying was kind of the latest tweak of our platform what it does is it draws a boundary around something it already knows what it thinks it is where it asks you what do you see in front of you so there's sort of three questions so we're just sort of going through how do you train the AI how do you train citizens one thing that's really interesting at the moment is with gen AI um, so um, there's all the stories about the, the AI world at the moment and people being sacked from uh, Chat G, 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 Open AI, I think it is, gone to Microsoft. Microsoft's next uh, Windows has a thing called Copilot. And Copilot assists you as you're writing a letter or writing a piece or build, building a presentation. Actually, what we're looking at is how can we use Gen I, that kind of Copilot thing, to help our citizen scientists identify things. And if they get it wrong, how can you teach? So I think with all this stuff, we don't have all the answers, but what you're starting to see is the, our capacity to, to get answers. And that's what I mean by scalability. We might, people, scientists have looked at citizen science and gone, not good enough, not credible enough. Actually, the technology is gonna help us train a workforce. Uh, so that's probably the answer. The other thing we've done with AI, and we've just got a minimum viable product of it now, is start to use the AI to find bleaching. So they're similar, but different kind of challenges. But, and that's successful. Thanks, Andy. Um, question here. Oh. Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, there are there are multiple citizen science programs out there at the moment, and there's some really good ones. Uh, Reef check, you know, 
great, great stuff, for example. High nitrous is really popular. People love it, right? I think what we've done from the census perspective is we wanted um, seascape images. And we wanted it to be so easy that if you're a competent snorkeler and you had a GoPro, you could jump in the water and get them. So the way that we source our images, we ask people to jump in the water. Every five fin kicks, you take a photograph with your GoPro or something similar, and then you make it as easy as possible to upload. Now, all of those things can be improved dramatically over the next sort of two or three years. You've got things like Starlink and all those kind of things. are going to make things a lot easier. That's what I mean. The technology is going so fast. That's why citizen science really can become as credible as, as um, old school. Um, but um, in terms of do we take other... Actually, what we're doing right now, I was talking about the bleaching part of the AI, we've put in a call out to people all over the world, particularly in the reef community, to send in their images of bleaching so that we can train the AI. Quite how we build the citizen into that, we're sort of working on at the moment. But um, there should be cross-pollination in all this stuff. And as the technology gets better, that's definitely going to happen. Um, and it can't be competition. That's the really important thing. So often on our boats, and I think Adam's going to speak later. He did census on his, but he was also doing iNaturalist. He was doing uh, Reef Check and various other things with Adam. But, um, so there is room for this community to be doing loads more together. I think systems are an important part of that. Not getting regulated out of, um, out of uh, business is another part of that. Um, and that often sort of happens. So, but we should see this as innovation space. And, and it's a good aspiration to be able to do that, to be honest. Okay, question up. I think we'll go... To Put the time here, up the back there, and then this one here. Hang on, just got to mi try a microphone this time. My name's Jolene Maleem. I'm a secondary teacher and marine conservationist. Um, I'm just wondering, I've seen those stars before in a feature by Zac Efron, but yeah. I was wondering whether it had been looked into um, tying the coral with um, something other than plastic zip ties, the metal zip ties for example or dissolvable metal yeah it's a um, it is a uh, a massive re you would not believe the amount of people working on that particular problem um, I actually met the guy so the story of these stars is quite an interesting one Frank Mars from the Mars is like the grandchild of the founders of Mars uh, his father uh, ran the Mars chocolate factory in Victoria back when he was a kid and as on his 18th birthday I think he was uh given a trip to Lizard Island. He's in his 60s, I think, now. But he's given a trip to Lizard Island uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. He fell in love with the reef. So many, many, he's American, right? But uh, many, many years later, um, with the reef, um, with all the problems on the reefs and reef conservation, he tasked some engineers to come up with a way of stabilising rubble and building this. And that's how those stars were, de were developed. And I met the guy, the engineer, who came up with this, who's still, now retired, is still working on how do you replace those bloody cable ties. Um, so there isn't an answer. They have tried many, many things. I saw a prototype for something to replace them uh, the other day. But I think, you know, uh, I hear the problem with the plastics. It's absolutely uh, a, legit, a legit question. We need to, but we're at that moment now, we're trying to find how do you do these things. So it's in the innovation sort of side of it. So no answer yet, but they may have come up with one. It's, you know, but it's, it's something that worries lots of people. I guess the issue would be if it forms a, a solid long-term reef that's, you know, calcium carbonate, then that's fine, it's locked up in there, yeah. right? But if a cyclone comes through and smashes everything up, which can happen, yeah. then those plastic could be liberated and float to the top and then be an issue with fauna, for example. Yeah, so they... Testing it, yeah. Yeah, the, the, so the stars are, are steel. So they break down eventually. So they will down. break down, but... Yeah. Um, uh, and there has we seen... This is a Mars project, but I've seen they had a storm in Indonesia where it did rip up some of the stars off the floor. Um, that didn't happen, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Yeah. So it needs to be resolved. Yeah. Of course, we get much stronger cyclones than they do in Indonesia because yeah. we're way well, this close again. Yeah. 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 Well, I think you have a question there, please. We'll make this our last question. You can talk to Andy before he has to head back up to, up to Cairns. Thanks for the talk so far. Hi, I'm Leela Higgins, co-founder of the City Nature Challenge, another global project. Uh, what are you thinking about for like longevity, like after you maybe leave the organization, retire, die, we're all gonna die sometime. Um, and, and also like, how do you keep going? Dark. I know. 
I do that sometimes. Uh, but how do you keep that like energy going for yourself, having run a project for like almost ten years? Sometimes it can get like. How yeah, do you it's do a really that? good question. I think that like because there's a balance there, right? If you uh, sort of found this with Earth Hour, I worked on Earth Hour for eight years, and you get to a point where you go, um, uh, do you need someone new, and do you do I need to do something? Um, but also you can, this exponential change is normally at the front end. Um, I think with this, my lessons from Earth Hour is to make sure you leave systems. So now it's much easier actually because most of the systems are actually technology, which is constantly updating and there's some other people than me coming in already in my team behind me uh, and across the whole thing. But I also think, like I'm the CEO of Citizens, but I won't be the CEO of Citizens forever. Um, building a good team behind you is part of that. But, um, but also, you don't have to necessarily, unless you're really annoying and they just want you to go away, um, you don't have to leave something without, you know, you can have a better leader coming after you and you can still be involved and help bring more energy in, in, in different ways, whether you're on a board or whether you're just, you know, an advocate once, you, once you've moved on. So that's kind of how I'd, I'd see that. But systems is obviously a key part of it and don't be too reliant on one person. Once you've got past the startup phase, that kind of gets easier. And there is a solution if you you've heard of these organic funerals. This is where you can you can be returned. You know, See, are we meant to be retreat? covering off my. We'll put Andy out on the nice. reef. We'll put his skeleton on the reef, and things will start growing over his skeleton. Oh well, Queensland needs to change. Uh, you can't you can't have organic funerals in Queensland. Okay, not yet. Oh, unless if you could seek permission. No. <laughs> so, so, look, can we thank Andy once again for his fantastic keynote? And. Oops.